welcome back to another Joe's Productions video. Today we're going to be taking a look at World War I. We're going to try to help you score a 5 on that A-Push exam in May. And if you're reading any A-Push textbook and you're studying World War I, this video is going to help you out. And one important point to keep in mind is, remember, U.S. entry into World War I was a slow process. In the beginning of the war, we are neutral. But continue violations of U.S. neutrality is going to put Woodrow Wilson in a difficult position. Remember, we had learned about events such as the sinking of the British ship, the Lusitania, the French ship, the Sussex. And Germany does apologize for the sinking of some of those ships, and there is a temporary pause in German sinking of ships. After the Sussex, they issue the Sussex Pledge where they promise not to sink any more ships without warning. However, Germany proceeds to commit other acts which angers many people in America. There is the Zimmerman note you should know about where the British intercept a German proposal to Mexico calling for a joint alliance. And basically, in the Zimmerman note, they're asking, Germany's asking Mexico to attack the United States, to form an alliance, and they would be allowed to recover the lost territory, that territory in the light green. This obviously causes a lot of anger in the United States, and in spring of 1917, Germany returns to unrestricted submarine warfare. They just start sinking ships. And they knew that this would cause the U.S. to enter into World War I, but they were hoping they would win the war before U.S. troops could get to Europe. Well, enough was enough, and in April of 1917, Congress declares war against Germany, the United States, enters World War I. In fact, when Wilson asked Congress to declare war, he says one of the things that he was hoping for was to make the world safe for democracy. Wilson really believed that this would be the war to end all wars. But make sure you know that the key factors for our involvement in World War I, one, German attacks on American shipping, two, the Zimmerman telegram proposing an alliance with Mexico, but don't forget that Wilson has a desire to be involved in the post-war settlement. Now when the war starts, the United States is completely unprepared for war. We have a lack of fighting men, factories are not prepared for war production, and the country has to mobilize for war. In fact, one of the first things they do is they pass the Selective Service Act, which basically starts conscription or a draft. It organizes a draft for soldiers to fight in the war. All men between a certain age have to register, and the big fighting force under General Pershing will be known as the American Expeditionary Force, and they will do a lot of the heavy fighting over in Europe near the end of the war. This is a total war effort, which basically means all aspects of the country mobilize for the war effort, so not just on the battlefield, but also on the home front. In fact, one of the big things that they needed to do was pay for the war, and the war will be financed by war bonds, sometimes referred to as liberty loans, and income taxes, which were allowed to be taken by the government as a result of the 16th Amendment. An important point you definitely need to keep in mind is that all these different agencies where the federal government and business working together will be created during World War I. This is a huge mobilization. So for example, you have the National War Labor Board, which was intended to help mediate labor disputes and prevent strikes. So the federal government working with organized labor and business to try to keep the war production going. Unions had different opinions about World War I. The American Federation of Labor supported the war effort, whereas the IWW oftentimes opposed the war and called for strikes during war production. Another government agency working with business was the War Industries Board. They would set production priorities for the war, so allocating scarce resources, centralizing control over raw materials and prices so that the war could be won with efficient production. Another one you should know about is the U.S. Food Administration, headed by a future president, Herbert Hoover, which encouraged Americans to conserve food for the war effort so that there would be enough meat, sugar, and other supplies for soldiers over on the battlefield. And an interesting thing happens as a result of this war effort is World War I boosted support for temperance or rather prohibition. In fact, support for the 18th Amendment increases and the 18th Amendment prohibited the sale, consumption, manufacture, or transport of alcohol. 
And there's a couple of different reasons why the war will do this. One, you want to conserve resources, which we need, food resources for the war effort. But also there's a lot of anti-German sentiment in the United States. And if you don't know much about beer, beer is very much a German tradition. Another aspect of the war that's important to know about is the effort to silence dissent or to stop people from opposing the war. And there were organizations run by the federal government, such as the Committee of Public Information. This one was headed by George Creel, very important guy, who promoted the U.S. war effort with propaganda. And their job was to create films and posters and speeches to get people to buy liberty loans, and war bonds, and to get people to support World War I. For those people that tried to oppose it, different laws were put in place. Espionage Act is one in 1917. It prohibited interference with the draft or the war effort. You could actually be put in jail. The Sedition Act was passed in 1918. This is much more broad than the Espionage Act. It banned anybody from criticizing the government, so you cannot speak ill of Congress, the President, the military, the American flag, and nearly around 2,000 people are arrested, um, many put in jail, such as Eugene Debs, for violating the Espionage and Sedition Acts. In fact, one of the things that happens as a result of the war is a huge increase in anti-German sentiment. In fact, nativist, anti-immigrant individuals attack all things German. They're referred to as the Huns in popular posters like the one you see right there. Now, I know what you're wondering, what about the First Amendment? And the Supreme Court of the United States did hear a case, one of the first cases, the first case, about the First Amendment, Schenck versus the United States. And what happens is there's a guy named Charles Schenck who was arrested. He's a socialist. He's arrested under the Espionage Act for mailing leaflets, pamphlets, to men eligible for the draft. And he basically is telling them, don't go and fight in this war. He's arrested under the Espionage Act, and he sues the government on the grounds that they are violating his First Amendment rights. And what happens in a unanimous decision, the Supreme Court supports the argument that freedom of speech could be restricted. And they basically say, Congress has the power to restrain speech, to ban speech, if it posed a clear and present danger. And they use this example that you're not allowed to go into a crowded theater and yell fire and claim First Amendment rights. And they say freedom of speech can be restricted. And it's really important that you understand there was a very restrictive atmosphere for civil liberties in America during World War I. And this is not the first time we've seen this delicate balance between security, being safe, and liberty our freedoms in a time of crisis. So World War I, we see things like the Espionage Act, the Sedition Act, and recall during the French Revolution, Federalists passed the Alien and Sedition Acts, basically taking away rights from people at a time of alleged crisis. And once again, during the Civil War, you see Lincoln using his suspension of the writ of habeas corpus to try to keep the border states in the Union. And we're gonna see this again and again. World War I is not the first time. World War I is going to have a huge impact on the home front. A lot of different groups are going to be impacted by the war. And in fact, African Americans were already, before the war even started, kind of roughly in 1910, large migration of African Americans to northern cities like Chicago. And this is called the Great Migration. And you can see that in this painting right here. There's a lot of reasons why African Americans are moving north. One, crappy racial relations, Jim Crow laws in the South, and so you want to get out. But what changes during World War I is the opening of new economic opportunities. Jobs in northern factories as white men were drafted and sent off to war. During this time you also see an increase in Mexican immigration into the U.S. to work in agriculture primarily in the Southwest to take over jobs that were needed during the war effort. Nearly 400,000 African Americans served in the U.S. Armed Forces. They do unfortunately serve in segregated units, but civil rights leaders like W.E.B. Du Bois felt that if African Americans fought for the United States during the war, that this would lead to greater equality when they return. This unfortunately was not a reality as 
Race riots break out in 1919. There's a lot of racial tension as a result of these demographic changes, such as the Great Migration. And you have race riots break out in cities such as Chicago. Women will play a key role in the war as well and will experience their own set of social changes. Women are going to take over jobs in factories as men leave. Jobs that were normally not open to women suddenly become available because the country needs them. In fact, because of the sacrifices of women on the home front during World War I, you will see finally the two-thirds needed majority in Congress finally supporting the 19th Amendment, which grants women's suffrage the right to vote. And great image right there of women protesting in front of the White House, demanding for the basic rights such as voting. As the war is winding down, Wilson has a vision for the post-war world, which is known as the 14 points. This is his proposal, and in it, he really wants to prevent another world war from happening. He wants to address the causes of the first world war and try to make sure that those things never take place. There are 14 points in this document, but we're only going to break down some of the important ones. So how's Wilson thinking he's going to accomplish this? Well, he's going to address some of those causes of the First World War. He wants to guarantee freedom of the seas, eliminate economic trade barriers, military reductions, no huge arms races taking place. He wants to get rid of colonies, in fact, allow self-determination for nations to have self-government, no more colonization. He wants no more secret treaties. And the big thing he really wants is he calls for the formation of a League of Nations to help prevent another war. The problem for Wilson is he does not get to dictate the terms of the post-war settlement. He has to work with the big four. It includes Wilson over there on the right. You have England, Italy, and France. And these allies are not really idealistic as Wilson was. Here he is in the political cartoon kind of asking for everlasting peace. But for nations such as France and England, they want to punish Germany gain territory, and use the war as an opportunity to benefit their country. So while Wilson wants peace without victory, the other allies are not really interested in his idealistic ideas. So the Treaty of Versailles very much reflects this rejection of much of Wilson's 14 points. They are rejected by the other allied powers, and you can see in the political cartoon kind of some of the things that they want. Wilson does get the League of Nations included. He really kind of is hopeful that this will be a worldwide organization that will prevent future wars, but he has to get it approved by the Republican-controlled Congress. And many Republicans in Congress hated the idea of the U.S. joining the League of Nations. And one of the big opponents of the treaty was Henry Cabot Lodge. And he belonged to a group called the Reservationists. And he believed that he would accept the League of Nations, he would accept the treaty, if certain changes were made. And Wilson was reluctant to compromise. There was another group of Republicans known as the Irreconcilables, and they were against the treaty no matter what Wilson was willing to do. And there is substantial debate over the League of Nations between Wilson and the Senate. And it comes down to a couple of things. One, there's a tradition of isolationist policies. We try to avoid European affairs. If you recall, George Washington had warned about the dangers of permanent foreign alliances. Another problem with the League of Nations amongst Republicans was the opposition over Article 10. And under Article 10, it said that member nations of the League of Nations would have to help other nations out in the event of external aggression. And there was a fear, as you could see in the political cartoon, that the League would force the U.S. to deal with foreign issues around Europe, that we would get dragged into Europeans' mess. And there also was the fear that Europe would meddle in the Western Hemisphere, which under the Monroe Doctrine, we did not want them to do. Another kind of factor amongst Republicans and others was the desire amongst many to be isolationists following World War I. We fought this brutal horrible war, and there was a feeling we just kind of wanted to focus on us. And ultimately, Congress rejects the treaty, the League of Nations is formed, and without the United States. A super important point to keep in mind, there's an old World War I tank. Many mark the U.S. rejection of the League of Nations as a withdrawal of the U.S. from international affairs in the 1920s. And as we're going to see in the next video, 
This is a little bit more complicated than that, but until next time, thank you for watching another Jost Productions video. If you haven't done so, subscribe. Help me spread the word all over the internet and tell your classmates. If the video helped you out, click like, and if you have any questions, post a comment. And until next time, peace.